Good morning and welcome to worship on this Sunday after Easter. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'd like to thank those joining me in worship today. Reverend Peter Perry and Reverend Amanda Nickel from First United Methodist Church of Olympia. Christopher Knight and Angelina Goldwell, also of First UMC Olympia. Reverend Pam Brokaw of Rochester and Oakville United Methodist Churches. Reverend Sandy Ward of Tumwater UMC. Reverend Ann Locke of Shelton UMC, who's unable to be with us this morning. And I'm Denise Roberts, pastor of St. Andrew's United Methodist Church. I just want to thank God for our South Sound Co-op, for all of the skills and the gifts and the talents that they bring, that God has given each and every one of us, that we put together to form this wonderful team that provides this worship service each week. And we pray, we all pray that during this time of worship, that, that each and every one of us might take something away from this service. Maybe it's a word or a piece of music, a song, something that helps to inspire us and to sustain us during the week. I invite us to join in this time of worship with a time of prayer. Holy and gracious God, we invite your presence to be among us. You spoke this world into motion and you breathe life into each and every creature. By your word, the heavens were made and by your spirit, O oh Lord, life began. Each day you bring to us light and warmth and rain and sunshine. And within the seeds of our existence, O oh Lord, you have planted in us your spark of life, for you are our God. Thank you, O oh God, that your love is beyond measure, stretching from time, starting with a garden in Eden, to a garden in Gethsemane, to Calvary and beyond. Thank you, O oh God, for the gift of your son, Jesus. In this time of worship, we ask that you open our eyes to see, open our lips that we might praise you, open our hands that we might serve you and share with others. And Lord, we ask that our feet may tread lightly on this earth and that our footsteps be worthy of following you, for truly we walk in the path that you have trod before us. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah to your name, Lord Jesus. This morning shines in the light of your love. The sun radiates your glory. The moon echoes your mystery. The birds sing your hymns and the trees clap their hands in praise of you. For you have created this world to praise you. Rain and clouds, beasts and cattle, mountains and fields shout your name. Rocks and flowers tell of your power. We too have been created to praise you. This morning may you open our dry lips and give us fresh language of praise. May we sing of your glory shining all around. And may we share in the external song of praise. And may we too shine in the light of your love. Will you share in this prayer with me? God of signs and wonders, breathe new life into us this day, that our spirits may awaken to the joy and the hope of our glorious inheritance through the living Christ. Clear our vision, Holy One, that we may see the promise of Easter in the stirrings of this precious earth and in the life energy flowing through our bodies. Help us find the faith to believe where we have not seen that others may see in our living and in our loving the glory of the risen Christ. Amen.
Scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 22. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church family. We all drew pictures of what we imagine Jesus looks like. We can put our pictures down. And we drew these because we have been talking today about the word ish. We read a storybook where there was a young man, Ramon, who was struggling because he didn't like his own artwork until his little sister Marcel pointed out that all of his pictures look ish. 
So boat-ish or house-ish or sun-ish. And that got us thinking about how we all have different ideas and imaginings of what Jesus looks like. And all of our pictures tell us a truth about Jesus that is Jesus-ish. Uh, in the same way that we think about that, we were thinking about the scripture story from 1 Peter that tells us that we, that says the people who are in, who received Peter's letter said, although you do not see him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. And that's just like us 2,000 years later. While we haven't seen Jesus in the flesh walking around, we see Jesus in a lot of places and we are all here trying our best to be Jesus-ish. So whenever we are being kind and loving and generous, when we share, when we reach out to one another with phone calls and video chats and all that sort of thing, we are all being Jesus-ish. And so we also decided to get to do another drawing, which was how Jesus makes us feel. And it's really hard to draw your feelings, but these are our feelings about Jesus-ish. So, I would like everyone to hold up their feeling pictures about how Jesus makes us feel. All right. There we go. Lots of different options for how Jesus makes us feel. And that is important. It's important for us to be able to recognize, and we can put our pictures down. Good job, everyone. That... Even if we are not 100% Jesus, or we can't 100% draw our feelings about Jesus, that just like the followers of Jesus from thousands of years ago, we are all doing our best to be Jesus-ish. And because we are being Jesus-ish, it helps other people to recognize Jesus. Because when they experience Jesus through our love and our kindness, our generosity, our ish, examples. Then when they recognize Jesus fully, they will be able to do that because we laid the groundwork <laughs> through our ish behavior. So let's pray about our hopes for this week. So this is going to be one of those repeat after me prayers. So let's make sure we're all off of mute. Okay, there we go. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, thank you for ish. Thank you for ish. Ish frees us. Ish frees us to do our best. To do our best. To try and be like you. To try and be like you. So that through our words and actions. Actions. We can help others. We can help, help others, others to recognize you. To recognize you. Help us. Help, help us to recognize you. To recognize you. In the ish. In the ish. Words and actions of others. Amen. New things can be scary. Adjusting to new realities can be scary. So more often than not, we tend to cling to the familiar. We hold on to those things that we know give us comfort and make us feel secure and safe and protected. I'm guessing right now, but I'm suspicious that the vast majority of us in our homes, wherever we may be in these present moments, are sitting behind locked doors. Am I right? Are your doors locked right now? And if your car is parked out in front or on your driveway or in a parking lot, I suspect that most of those cars' doors are locked. And right now, even our churches, standing empty today, are locked. And the reason should be obvious and so very reasonable. We lock our doors because we are afraid of what is out there on the other side. We don't want the equilibrium of our being to be disrupted. 
and so we lock the doors. Such security is perfectly sensible. In this world of ours, we need to take precautions. We don't want our cars stolen. We don't want strangers walking into our homes. We certainly don't want to be the victim of a burglary or something worse. And so we build strong walls and we put locks on our doors and, and those locks serve us quite well. But for just a moment, let us consider the possibility that our fear of something bad happening might cause us to shut out more than just the evil that would hurt us. Let us consider that those same locks that keep trouble away may also keep our fears locked in, our help locked out, and our ability to help others locked in. Choosing to lock a door is not always an easy decision. We keep things out, but we also keep things in. Last Sunday we celebrated Easter, and it was a glorious day. We remembered Mary's words to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Mary had come running back to the place where they had all gathered. I imagine her knocking impatiently on the door, which is, of course, locked. Mary waits as the lock is unfastened from within and the door swings open. In my imagination, it's Andrew who is the doorkeeper. And as Mary pounds on the door, Andrew lets her in. But as soon as she is inside, Peter yells, Andrew, lock the door! And Andrew locks the door carefully. The fear inside that room is palpable. Only when they are once again all safely behind that locked door can Mary speak the message that Christ in the garden gave to her to deliver to the disciples. I have seen the Lord! But the disciples were skeptical. They had seen Jesus die on the cross. They had watched as his body was laid in the tomb. They had mourned through the longest Sabbath any of them had ever experienced. Yes, they could believe that someone had broken into the tomb, which is what Peter and John had suggested a few minutes earlier with their report. Or they could believe that someone had stolen the body of their friend. But Mary's message was just too much. I have seen the Lord, she said. How could she? The Lord was dead, but Mary insisted, I have seen the Lord. Safe and secure behind their deadbolt, they doubted the message that Easter had happened. Andrew called out one of the disciples, Check that door again, will you? Make sure it's still locked. And it was. It was securely fastened. It was locked. No one could get in. They were safe for the time being, safe to consider what to do next. Jesus had always made those decisions. But now, where would they go? What would they do? How would they live? John's Gospel tells us that the disciples were afraid of the Jewish authorities. You see, Jesus had threatened the authorities, and so the authorities had him killed. Were they next, they wondered? Would the chief priests colluding with the empire come after them, arrest them, crucify them? And even if the authorities were to let them go in peace, would their lives still have meaning? Check the door again, Andrew. Make sure it's locked. I think they were all afraid that without Jesus, they had lost their purpose, their reason for being. After all, you can't be a disciple without having someone who disciples you. They were afraid that they would have to go back to being whoever they had been before they had known Jesus. They were afraid that Jesus' death meant that he was just a man, not special in any way. That God hadn't been with them and they hadn't been with God for all of these years that they had traveled together. They were afraid. Afraid that everything Jesus had taught them was gone, gone like water spilled from a broken jug. Is the door still locked, Andrew? There's no one outside trying to get in, is there? And the disciples, they were grieving for his life. Jesus had been their friend. His absence created in each one of their lives a void, a Jesus-shaped hole in their hearts. 
They were afraid that the, the answers to life's ultimate questions, the answers that Jesus had so carefully taught them, had been ripped from their souls, and they were filled with doubt and fear. Still, though, Mary insisted that she had seen Jesus in the garden alive. No one believed her, of course. Their hearts were troubled, and they were very afraid, but they weren't going to believe a woman, not even Mary. They knew what they knew. Jesus was dead, and they were afraid, and that's the way the world worked. They barely trusted the thick walls and the deadbolts on the door to keep out those who would come to arrest them. They, they couldn't yet see that those same walls and those locks also locked in the doubts and the fears which tormented them. Andrew, check the door. I just did. It's still locked. Occasionally, people would arrive or leave from this place where the disciples had gathered. Some of the disciples had left early in the morning, traveling home to Emmaus and Nazareth and Jericho. Thomas and some of the others were bravely searching the streets of Jerusalem, trying to learn what had happened to Jesus' body. James looked furtively out the window, but Andrew from his place by the door says, the door is still locked and we're safe here for now, for the time being. Safe, perhaps, but oh, so very fearful. The strong walls and the deadbolts on the doors might keep out the soldiers, but all the locks in Jerusalem could not keep out the fear in their hearts. And that's when it happened. In the midst of them stands Jesus. Peace be with you, he says. It is Jesus with them in the room. How can this be? The door is locked. The walls are so strong. And yet, here he is, standing among them. It's really Jesus. They know it is him, for they see his scars. In a moment, they come to know what Mary has known since the morning began. Now they can all say, we have seen the Lord. No lock, no wall, no doubts, no barrier of any kind can ever keep Easter from filling the rooms where the fear is great. Christ is risen. Christ rose. Christ is rising, and Christ will rise. Peace be with you, Jesus said. He said it twice to the disciples, as if to emphasize that this was no mere greeting of shalom. Peace be with you. Peace in the midst of fear, doubt, and grief. Peace in the midst of the confusion of the moment. Peace in the midst of all the changing circumstances of the world. Peace be with you. It is so much more than a simple greeting. It is a gift from God. It is a blessing. It is a promise. A few days before, Jesus had said to the disciples, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives, so do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Peace I give to you. And then Jesus says something more, something very, very important. Jesus says to the astonished disciples who are being whiplashed between fear and joy, between grief and elation, between despair and hope, this resurrected Jesus says, As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And in those words we hear the great challenge of the Easter story. This was no ending, it was a beginning. Christ's work did not end on the cross, it began there. His mission was now their mission, and it is still our mission today. As God sent Jesus into the world, so we are sent by Jesus. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And then we are told, Jesus breathed on them. He breathed on them and he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. This passage is often called John's Little Pentecost. Jesus breathes on the disciples and they receive the Spirit. Thomas, one of the disciples, wasn't there when Jesus appeared to them that day. And he doubted their story when he heard it later. He had to be convinced. But Jesus came again and showed him the scars. 
And others saw him on the Emmaus road in the breaking of the bread. And Paul saw him as he was thrown from his horse on Damascus road. The point of all these post-Easter stories is that Jesus is still with us as the future unfolds. God has work for us to do, but we are not alone. Our work is empowered by God's own Spirit, which lives in us. Receive the Holy Spirit. I suppose that in this season of social distancing, of latex gloves and face masks, being breathed on by another person takes on a, a new meaning. But unlike our current realities, in the breath of Jesus, there is never the potential for death. But there is always the potential for life. Life in abundance, life eternal, life in Christ, for Christ, with Christ, the life of the Spirit. Do you remember the old hymn? Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew, that I may love what thou dost love, and do what thou wouldst do. Breathe on me, breath of God, until my heart is pure, until with thee I will one will to do and to endure. As the Father has sent me, Jesus said, so I send you. Jesus breathes on the disciples and commissions them, challenges them, sends them out into the world, the world beyond the locked doors, to continue the work of telling all people the great good news that they are beloved of God, graced by God, welcomed by God, created and nurtured and saved by God. We are sent to proclaim God's truth, sent as emissaries of a risen Christ sent to go into every locked room, wherever fear reigns, and there proclaim the words of Christ, Peace be with you. And that's exactly what the disciples did. They overcame the circumstances of their present crisis, and they went out into the world, and they did the work which Jesus called them to do. They overcame their fears. They stepped out in faith. They proclaimed Easter, and they made Jesus real in the world around them. Being Jesus in and for the world is not an easy thing to do. For the times that we live in always present challenges. That was true for the disciples in their day, and for every generation since then. And it is certainly true for us in our time today. In the epistle reading for today, in 1 Peter chapter 1, we have a great summary of the Christian message. It starts off by saying, praise God, praise God. You know, you can never go wrong by starting with praises, right? Praise God. Go ahead, church, don't be bashful. Give God a little praise right now, wherever you are. I'll wait. Praise God. Praise God. The passage begins with praises, but then it has this lovely one-sentence summary of the Christian faith, which I'll paraphrase this way. By God's mercy, you are born into hope because Jesus was raised, and you are saved by God's power for a great inheritance that's just waiting to be revealed. So rejoice! And that's an in the garden with Mary moment. Good news on Easter. By God's mercy, you are born into hope because Jesus was raised and you are saved by God's power for a great inheritance that's just waiting to be revealed. So, Christian, rejoice. But then Paul adds a, a locked up in the upper room with the frightened disciples word. And he says, of course, right now we have to suffer through these times of trial and our faith will be tested but strengthened. However, you love God even though you cannot see God, and even now you are receiving the promise of your faith, the salvation of your souls. It's a reference to the coming day of the Lord being the fulfillment of the promises of Easter, the assurance of the things we hope for, the culmination of the love that we can give because so much love has been given to us. That great and glorious day is promised to us, a day when at last we will be forever with our God. 
Something deep within us longs for that day. We are made to be in God's presence, not locked in a room, afraid and anxious. There is a great day coming. And we see a hint of it in the events of Easter. But again, church, remember, Easter is not the end of the story, but the beginning. Change is still happening. God is still creating. We are on a lifelong journey with our God. The disciples had their fears and anxieties. But they dared to open the locked doors when the time was right. And they went out into the world confidently proclaiming a God of goodness and love. Throughout our history as a people, we have lived through wars and famines and deadly pestilence. As individuals, we have come through storms and illness and loss. Again and again, the forces of fate and evil have tried to knock us down and rip from our hearts the faith that has sustained us. Time and again, we have risen up. And we have overcome our fears so that we could once again sing God's praise more loudly and proclaim God's love more fully. It has always been so. For we are Easter people who believe that God not only gives life to begin with, but God is continually transforming life. We do not just celebrate Easter as a once upon a time event. Rather, we aspire to Easter as a way of being a way of being that we see repeated in every human life, epic after epic, century after century, year after year, throughout human history, until history ultimately will be consummated. You know, when a, when a caterpillar weaves its cocoon, it retreats from the world, it builds a protective shell. But the cocoon is not a tomb, is it? A tomb is a place where dead things decay, but the caterpillar is not decaying. It is changing. And soon the cocoon miraculously opens, and what emerges is not the old caterpillar, but a, a brand new butterfly. So too, Jesus does not emerge from the grave on Easter morning as he was when he was laid there on Good Friday. What comes forth by the power and wonder of God is something new and better. Jesus is not simply reanimated or resuscitated, but is rather transformed. Resurrection is transformation. Never forget that, church. It may feel in these days of isolation like we are in a tomb, but we are not. I don't know exactly what these strange times are, but because I believe in Easter, I believe with every fiber of my being that we are going to emerge from this experience alive in ways we've never imagined. We will emerge as new creations in a new world. We will emerge more beautiful, stronger in our broken places, and more ready for the coming day of the Lord, which quite possibly is yet forever and a day away, but toward which we are always moving by the grace of our God. So pray, my friends. Pray that these times in which we live will be transformational times. Pray that we, we will emerge from these days of isolation discontent with what once was and ready for so much more. When at last, whenever it will be, we put away our masks and our gloves and we step boldly toward one another again. May we be stronger than we were before, more appreciative of one another, more aware of our connectedness, more grateful for our present moments, and more hopeful in our future that is always unfolding. Sonia Renee Taylor, a poet and a writer, recently wrote these words, We will not go back to normal. Normal never was. Our pre-corona existence was not normal other than we normalized greed, inequity, exhaustion, depletion, extraction, disconnection, confusion, rage, hoarding, hate, and lack. We should not long to return, my friends. We are being given the opportunity to stitch a new garment, one that fits all of humanity and nature. What we have been forced to leave behind, we need to leave behind. What is getting us through is what we need to take forward. Dream. While we have so much time, dream of the life you want. Dream of the world you desire to exist in. Look for the places in your new dreams that have parts of the old world and remove them. What is the dream then? 
From there, we can add to the collective weaving of whatever it is that is next. If we are going to heal, let it be glorious. I don't know about you, but right now it feels like we're locked in our rooms with our doubts and our deadbolts, and the day of the Lord seems so far away, and we are so often afraid and worried. But wait, Easter is still happening. Easter is always happening. I know that no one can ever explain how Jesus came through the locks and walls in that room and appeared to the disciples, nor can anyone explain how the risen Jesus breaks through the locks and walls of our doubt-filled lives again and again and again. Nevertheless, he does. God comes. Christ comes. The Spirit comes through the locked doors of our fearful lives and says to all of us, Peace be with you. You with your fears and doubts, peace be with you. You with your longing and hope, peace be with you. You with your guilt and shame, peace be with you. You with your loneliness, peace be with you. You who are tired and so weary of striving, peace be with you. You who are mourning, peace be with you. Peace be with you. In the days and weeks to come, May we with confidence unlock the doors and move beyond the thick walls and seek always to follow a risen Lord, saying along with Mary and Thomas and Peter and Andrew and John and all the disciples, we have seen the Lord. And may we carry the message of Jesus into all the world. Peace be with you, church. Peace be with you. Amen. Will you pray with me? This morning we seek your peace, O Lord. We seek confidence and release from fear to be transformed by faith. As the disciples were locked away in fear, we too find ourselves staying home, away from those we miss and who we seek to gather with in person. We pray this morning for the peace that comes only through you, regardless of physical circumstance. Open our eyes that we may see your comforting and joyful presence among us, even with closed doors and restrictions on our movement. We pray for a shift, a sea change, a holy understanding that all of this is temporary, Life in you is eternal. We lift our hearts to you as we seek to breathe in your sacred gift of the Holy Spirit that transforms, releases, and makes all things possible. Courage in the storm, patience in the waiting, the capacity to see you in all situations. We acknowledge that the peace we seek the grace we desire to embrace fully requires action on our part. We are to forgive others of their transgressions, those who have hurt us, those who do harm, and we too are to be gentle with ourselves. Sometimes, O oh Lord, it is harder to forgive ourselves than it is to forgive the sins of others. We pray for restoration and reconciliation in all relationships. We pray for your just ways that do not condone harm, only love. Our doors may be shut, but we know you are here with us. You are present and offer new life to us all. Help us to believe fully in your promise of new life. Remove the doubt from us. Help us to see that in you there is freedom from fear and captivity. In you there is hope and healing promise. We know that our help comes from the Lord. We humbly and faithfully give thanks in this life, this life of grace that you give us. Amen. Resurrection is about hope. Death and sin are never the end of the story. 
And on this second Sunday of Easter, we celebrate that as the church, we are signs and instruments of God's resurrection hope in the world. When we give, we are joining in the work of hope that God is raising up in our communities and the world. God takes our ordinary dollars and transforms them into extraordinary signs of life that bless far beyond what we are able to see and understand. Your South Sound United Methodist churches are bringing hope in some beautiful ways. Listen to this list, which is just some of the resurrection work that is being done. In this time of the COVID-19 pandemic, our churches are offering monetary assistance to the community. We are gathering pet food, pet food and distributing it to people who cannot afford to feed their animals. Masks are being made and distributed. A flower cross was put up for the community to be able to bring flower offerings during Holy Week. Prayer cards have been put out for the community so that community prayers can be received and lifted to God. Food is being collected. School districts are being assisted with their free lunch program. People are being equipped to send cards of caring to other people. Breakfast and dinner meals are being served. Our buildings are being offered to local hospitals and to host blood banks. Homeless meals are being served. The preschool at Lacey St. Andrews is continuing with distance learning even at a financial loss. Community organizing work is being done. Baked goods are being delivered to the homeless. These are just a few of the things that are bringing life and hope into our communities during this time. So please give generously. It is an act of worship and praise to God, but it is also an act of hope. You can give by going to the First Olympia United Methodist Church website, and there you'll find a button that you can click to give. You can choose which of the churches in the South Sound United Methodist Cooperative uh, receive your giving. You can also mail a check to your local church. The address for your local church can always be found on the church website. Or you can go into your online banking system and set up automatic bill payer so that money will be given to your church each month. However you choose to give, your offering is a blessing, not just to your church, but to the community and to the world.
Will you join me in giving God thanks for the good gifts that we have received? Generous God, giver of life, of hope, of resurrection, we are your Easter people called to live into the promise of new life. We are signs of your hope, bringers of your love, bearers of your blessing to the world. Receive these humble offerings that we present and multiply them in mysterious ways so that they become twofold, threefold, fourfold blessings. May they bring your love and joyous presence into our world. Amen.
on behalf of the South Sound Co-op, I leave you with this benediction. Let us be in a time of prayer. Holy and gracious God, let your majesty be the light by which we walk. Let your compassion and the compassion of Jesus the Christ be the love by which we walk. And let the presence of the Holy Spirit be the power by which we walk. And as we go in peace from this place in our places of worship today, may the triune God watch over each and every one of us on every road that we may follow. Go in peace and may you have a blessed week. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. <laughs>